All right, next up we have Jose Vega. Jose Emmanuel Vega serves as Deputy Director for Oklahomans for Equality and the Dennis R. Neal Equality Center. He is a chairman of the Tulsa Hispanic Affairs Commission and is on the advisory boards of the Tulsa Community Service Council, the Mental Health Association and Planned Parenthood. Jose is passionate about promoting diversity, eliminating homophobia, and advocating for LGBTQ hate crime protections and rights. Please everybody welcome Jose Vega. Hello everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, my name is Jose Manuel Vega. I work for, for Oklahoma for Equality, the Dennis Arnett Equality Center, and it's the seventh largest LGBTQ community center in the entire world. And it's located here in Tulsa, Oklahoma which is amazing, it's beautiful. And uh, Tori, oh, I, want her, I want her to be my new best friend. Um, she, she was amazing. But I want to highlight on that aspect on the last, the last um, uh, sentences that she was saying, the last phrases on donating to your local, bit, uh, local organizations, individuals. This is important because the Dennis Arnett Equality Center, Oklahoma for Equality, does not receive any federal funds state funds or city funds. We are basically, basically on individuals who donate, on family foundations, on individuals who, it's heartbreaking, they come in, I only have $5, but I wanna give it to the organization because of all the work they do and help my community. And there's only seven employees to run the Equality Center and we're open from nine to nine every single day. Christmas, New Year's, Mother's Day, Father's Day, um, Thanksgiving, it's every day. And now with COVID-19, we did have to um, close the center, um, pay cuts were established, but all of us were stay, stay, staying together and working for um, the cause. So I want to talk a little bit about my story and what inspires me to move and help continue on the, um, the, or, the organization and um, my life mission. Um, I, coming from a Hispanic background, um, very religious, very Catholic, a um, lot of homophobia. I, I, was, I, I endured 10 months of conversion therapy. So I'm a survivor of conversion therapy. And each conversion therapy treatment is different. I'll share a little bit about my experience for 10 months. Um, it was praying as soon, I had to wake up early. So as soon as I woke up before going to school, it was always three hours before. And I had to be on my knees for three hours in the morning, praying. And then at night before going to bed, it was another three hours on my knees praying. Then droplets were introduced. And these were, um, I remember it was a small black bottle. And I had to take these drops after every meal, after every activity, after if I had impure thoughts and so forth. It was making me sick. And uh, I was just throwing everything up, not keeping any food down. Then um, a video was introduced to me. And in this video, it was about a man who died and God took him through hell and showed him how every sin is paid and then brought him back to life to share with the community, with the world, how um, every sin is paid. And so if you're a thief, this is the way you pay it. If you do this, this is the way, if you murder, this is the way you pay it. Not to be graphic, but um, for, for the first month or so, I had to watch the entire film. And then afterwards it was just, he just needs to watch the homosexuality film. We need to embed it in his mind. And every time I talk about it, it is like a video cassette playing in my head exactly per word and phrase that it says. To summarize, I was 14 at this time. The way that homosexuality pay, is paid in hell is by a hot metal rod penetrated through the anal canal, up through the body and out the throat at multiple times. And to see this, at 14, I was scared. I started fearing and I said, yes, I do want to change. I do want to change. I don't want to die. And they continually said, you're going to get HIV. You're going to get AIDS. You're going to die. You're not going to go to heaven. And I lived in fear. And that's 
I think what, that's what endured those 10 months that, okay, I'll continue, I'll continue, I'll try harder. Afterwards, I called it, I told them, I can't do this anymore. I feel sick. I can't keep anything down. And um, co complimenting suicide was, I felt that was my main exit. Um, I do have a suicide story. Um, do remember going to the hospital, getting my stomach pumped and everything. But after all of that, I denied the treatment. I didn't want to continue. This time I'm 15 and family said, then you can't be part of our family. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, so I was kicked out and on my own at the age of 15. I put myself through high school. I couch surfed. Sometimes I slept under a bridge near the school, but never, but this is the thing, no one was able to find out. I was able to wear a mask, pretend, find a phone where if the school needed to talk to a family member or parent, I would answer that phone, pretend I was my family, and then say, oh, I don't speak, I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak English, so Jose's gonna have to translate. And so I made all the decisions for myself I forged signatures to do whatever I needed to do, but I was afraid. I was afraid to um, not have the ranks of my life and my decisions um, and, fall, and fall in a foster system. Also where I was able to interview kids in my school who are in the foster system, who are in the shelters, and they explained how sad they were, how um, they couldn't make decisions. They felt like they were tied and um, they couldn't follow their dreams. And it was heartbreaking and I said, I just didn't want to fall into that. So I put myself through high school, then to put myself to college, family came back around, they apologized. And I'm a firm believer that um, in order for you to continue on life with happiness, um, you have to forgive and I forgive my family. I don't want darkness in my heart, um, but I, but. I don't forget, and I did share with them. I will continue sharing my story and hopefully inspire other young gay Latinos who um, still are man of faith to continue on, that you're, there's nothing wrong with you and um, you can be, you can love someone because the only message that God is sending is love one another. And so that is what, that's what inspires the work here at the Dennis Hernandez College Center, my aspect also. I work on a lot of other projects remote, um, remotely. I, we started chapters. And this is something Marcia, um, one of our, um, I see her name here, um, had helped start as well with the Equality Center. And now I'm coming in trying to uh, be the director of it and um, connect everyone. And these chapters are finding small safe places in these rural areas in Oklahoma. And whenever we do small pride gatherings, um, small get-togethers, hearing young LGBTQ individuals saying, I thought nothing like this ever existed anywhere. I only saw it on social media, but it was miles away. I never thought that I would be close here. And hearing their stories, it just, it is, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's beautiful all at the same time. And to know that we saved their life in, in a way is also impactful. Um, I also work with the Hispanic community trying to limit that homophobia and try to insert myself in places where I can elevate those voices. There's been many times where in the Hispanic community, oh, well, you're, you're making it about a gay issue. I was like, well, if you are for Black Lives Matter, you are for trans life, for Black trans life matters. If you are for immigrants' um, rights, you are for LGBTQ immigrants and refugees. It's, a, it's, it's trying to make everybody understand this intersectionality. And that's, I think that's the most difficult work right now. Everybody's all for you know, all these movements, but they're not understanding the intersectionality. I see a question. Can you speak on what Latino culture thinks about LGBTQ? They, it's, it's, it's not fully accepted. It's not accepted. It's not accepted. And what do they think? There's a lot of machismo. I remember growing up, um, machismo is um, masculinity, toxic masculinity, a lot, in the way of women are supposed to be in the kitchen. 
They, they are the ones who are responsible to clean, to cook, to take care of the kids. The man is supposed to do the heavy lifting, do the, bring, the, bring um, money to the house, bring uh, food to the house, um, and do all of that, all, all of the male, female characteristic stuff. And I remember growing up on that. I remember hating getting dirty and having to go work with my dad, either lawn stuff or doing things. I just, I wanted to be with my aunts, with my female cousins in the kitchen cooking and so forth. And they constantly kept saying, that is maricon. Maricon is translated is faggot in Spanish. And growing up, constantly being told that you are a maricon, you are a maricon if you want to be with your aunts, if you're working, if you're playing with dolls with your female cousins, if you're, if you're a maricon, if, you know, you don't play soccer with your cousins outside, with your male cousins, and so forth. So it, it was, it's very, it was, it's very toxic. A lot of individuals, a lot of LGBTQ folks, families that I've worked with, and I've tried to help them understand when their daughter, their son, come out as trans, bisexual, um, LG, any, LG, any letter in the LGBTQ community, when they come out, the family's always like, where did I mess up? What, what did I do wrong? Um, I didn't take her to church enough. Um, I should not have let her hang out with those friends of hers. And they continue to blame themselves. And what I try to do is help them understand that there's nothing wrong with them that they are still the individual that they grew up, that they love and adore. The only thing is, is that they want to have a partnership, a relationship with this individual, no matter what their um, sexual orientation is. Um, I first learned about conversion therapy in grad school and I remember being sick in my stomach. This is okay. okay, yeah. And so at that time, sorry, I was reading a comment. At that time, um, when I was going through conversion therapy, even and what brought me to the center, I always knew about the Equality Center. Um, but I never knew that it was called conversion therapy, what I went through. I just thought that that's what, that's what people do. There was other individuals that I shared uh, their experience with. Um, there was other individuals that um, shared even more traumatic experiences through conversion therapy. And each one is, 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 is traumatizing. So what brought me to the center was when me and two friends went to a gay bar. And I am from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was born and raised. I am first generation here. Uh, families from, um, are immigrants from Mexico. Um, so what brought me here, what, what brought me to the center was my, my, myself and two friends went to a gay bar. My two friends are undocumented, but they have their passports from their country. And so I give my Oklahoma ID, my friends give their passports, and at the door, the door individual says, where's the stamp that proves that they're here legally? And I asked, um, this is a bar, not Homeland Security, and this is a valid ABLE, Able Commission approved ID. And she says, well, I have to I have, to have proof that they're here legally, um, because it's against the law to serve to illegal people. And as I, at that time, was like, well, that is, Fucking racist of you to ask. Um, and if I could speak to your manager. And so um, the manager was her son. And the son said, yes, it is against the law to serve to legal people. So either you guys leave or I'm going to call immigration and get you deported. Call ICE. And so what was most heartbreaking in there was that how can a marginalized community marginalize another? And that's what I don't get when the his the Latino community, the brown community, the black community, the, um, undocu the undocumented community, any community, you are a marginalized community and you're marginalizing another. And that is so true. The oppressed will always oppress. And it's heart it, that's heartbreaking. And it's just um, a domino effect, a ripple effect that just, there's a never ending circle, not until we all come together and unite efforts as an intersectionality work and understand that not until every human, no matter what, who um, they are, is legal and have a safe place, is, will be, everybody will be safe. So that is why also I advocate for undocumented immigrant folks. Um, I do have the privilege to have been born here and I do have the privilege to have learned English. Um, but growing up with a family who's undocumented, 
who had the fear of getting stopped. I remember living in the shadows with them. Um, my, my father, my aunts, um, my, the current stepmom that I would have had. Um, and I say that because my dad's been married six times. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yes. So uh, living in the shadows with them of a fear of like, oh, we just got stopped, sit down, or who's at the door, or please don't have anybody call the house, an English word that we don't know of. Don't let anybody know that we live here. Um, living in that shadow and afraid and fear, I, I, when I was young, I didn't know, I didn't understand. Um, and now, years now that I know, I want to help elevate those voices. And in order for you to be safe, I will speak up on your behalf, on your, I will share your story, your experiences. Um, if you are too afraid, if you don't, if you don't want to, if, I don't want anybody to risk their immigration status. That's also why I'm against the 287G program here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that has a partnership with the sheriff department, has deported many, many, fam has separated many families, have, uh, many families have been stopped just because of a turn signal um, light that is out. And they get stopped, they get, they get, booked into the David O. Moss Sheriff, um, police jail. And once they're booked and they find out, oh, he's undocumented, quickly, an ice hold, quickly. And they're separation of family. Um, and you, people advocate and fight and try to get them out bond. And there's several, several families, several stories where I paid the bond, he should be out. Well, I already took him this morning, we forgot to tell you. And it's, 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 it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking also hearing two stories that came to us, letting us know that two LGBTQ individuals were brutally raped and assaulted during an ice hold here at the Tulsa County Jail. And once the Equality Center got involved and started doing the investigation, they got transferred. Oh, well, they got transferred. So like now they, now there's another city and state's problem. So um, we, we can't give you that, we can't give you that information because now it's under federal law. And so it's like, you're, you're constantly making barriers. You're constantly trying to drown these individuals in suffering and you, there's nothing you can do. And so those are all the things why I fight for what I fight. And with this year, with, with Trump coming to Tulsa, um, with him had selected on Juneteenth and now doing a political stunt of, oh, no, I'm just, I scheduled, I rescheduled it just for you all and so forth. It was a political stunt. There's so much things that I started talking about, like now we need to do a little bit of self-care because it, 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 gets, it gets to the point, it's too much. At the Equality Center, whenever there's a Black Lives Matter rally, we are there. Whenever there is an immigrants rally, we are there. Whenever there's a um, rally because they, because somebody, because 45 has made a uh, Muslim ban, we are there. When, uh, when there's an attack, right now there was, an, uh, Terry spoke about the attack on transgender individuals on the healthcare and the Affordable Care Act, we're there. We're, we're all in these intersectionality works. What's heartbreaking in is seeing the community that whenever there is an LGBTQ issue, those individuals, those leaders fail to report whenever we do a rally. It's only LGBTQ people and the most progressive individuals that who have a family member who's LGBT. Um, and that's where I, uh, I've decided to start helping individuals understand the intersectionality work. Um, there's lots of work to do here in Oklahoma still. Um, we do not have hate crime protection. We do not have employment protection. We do not have housing protection. We do not have public accommodation protection. Tulsa has housing protection, but it was pushed for many, many years. And finally, and that's just, a, just, just here, here's a nipple. Please keep your mouth shut. We got other things to do and just throw, just throw a bone. The city of Tulsa did um, add um, LGBTQ protection employment and just Last year, I see Dr. Laura Aerosmith, who also helped with this, um, 
add transgender protection, employment protection in um, their employment policies. And now they have Blue Cross Blue Shield to, um, for transgender benefits for city employees. And so it's such a great example, but there's much more we can do. Um, and I say this because the city of Norman in Oklahoma has all those protections in place. They have housing protection, they have employment protection, they have public accommodation, and they have hate crime. They have, how does the city of Norman have all of these and Tulsa being the second city, second largest city, or even Oklahoma City, but Tulsa on behalf, because that's where I live, that's where I work, that's where I play, and that's where I advocate and work with our mayor. If Tulsa is so welcoming, so progressive, and so awesome, and oh, we're moving the, the ring for the, the needle forward. Mm, no, you're not. Smoke and mirrors. That's how I feel now. And things might fall into place later, but I'm at, I'm at a point. And I think this is where all advocates are. Because I never take off my hat. If you work for the LGBT Community Center, you're never taking off your hat on LGBT, on, on equal, human equal rights. And people are tired. People who, are, who, aren't, who aren't getting paid to do, to do the advocacy work, uh, and I, I work for the people, I'm a servant of the people. So when I tell people, I'm working for you, People are tired. They have a nine to five job. They have family to feed and take care and have family time. And then they also have to get out of their house and go protest. Of course, people are tired. And I, I never take off my hat. Anywhere I go, any, anybody asks me, can you please join this committee? Can you please join this board? Okay, I'll join. But let me see how many women are on that board, okay? How many POCs are on that board? How many individuals living with disabilities? How many LGBTQ others? How many Latinos? How many all of this? I want to make sure you have every voice represented. I don't want anybody tokenized. So there you go. I think, I think this is a whole thing like of, of having to express and share. I see a question, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, are you aware of any uh, conversion therapy places in Oklahoma? So there, there, there is, um, there, there was an interview. I'm trying to remember. I don't know on the top of my head. And I, if I was at the center, I could pull up a list. But I would, I would share that with Erica. If Erica can share that with all everybody individuals. There is a few priests in Oklahoma City that do um, support the conversion therapy. And... Um, not in the way that I have expressed it, more of clinical therapy and like conversation and um, other non-lethal methods about that. Because I say non-lethal because um, they're not in digesting or putting things in their body. It's just conversations. But don't want to diminish the effects of it. But there are. And for the first time in history, um, this year's le legislation, it only went out of committee, but a bill to ban conversion therapy um, with individuals who have a um, license. Um, so like a psychologist or anybody cannot never practice those. And it was just a little glimpse of hope, just a little glimpse. And it went out of committee and it was amazing. It, it felt wonderful. But just like that, boom, it was gone. There's so much more work still needing to be done. Um, but yeah, do you ever go to uh, speak in Tulsa schools? I have. I have joined some talks at the GSA's Gay Straight Alliance programs, um, the Gender and Sexuality Alliances in schools. I have spoken. We have a great, amazing partnership with. Um, Tulsa um, Youth Services, they have GSA coordinators um, and navigators. And so we have done a lot of youth programming. I do see uh, Shannon Fair on this call. She is amazing. She runs, uh, she helps run along with um, two other individuals at the Equality Center, Alphabet Soup, where we try to teach um, and 
have a build a sense of community within our youth, um, LGBTQ youth. And I have been a guest speaker there. She has many guest speakers come in and share their story, how to advocate in their own schools, their neighborhoods, um, and so forth. My kids attend. Oh, good. <laughs> yes, it is beautiful. And it's these individuals who they, we all might not change the entire world, but we can change our world. We are changing and impacting individuals who we are close reach. But it's, it's, it's at a larger level that we're, where we need help. It's constantly trickling down um, to, to us, uh, all of these issues and problems. Um, Jose? Yes. Are you aware of any conversion therapy places in Oklahoma? And if so, are there groups, policies, or anything we can do as counseling professionals to shut them down? Question. Um, yes, yeah. So I, I will share that list with Erica. Um, I'm, only, I'm, I'm aware of two individuals who are um, licensed therapists in Oklahoma City that um, have offered to help cure or eliminate um, these impure thoughts and so forth. Um, but what you can do is um, share, share how traumatic these practices are. Um, email, not email, write letters, make phone calls to your legislators and let them know, and your representatives, let them know these other cities, these other states have implemented um, bans to conversion therapy. Um, there's a word that's constantly thrown here in Tulsa that Tulsa wants to be a world-class city. If you do your research, these world-class cities have these bans, have these LGBTQ protections. They don't have the 287G program. So if Tulsa truly wants to be a world-class city, you need to eliminate all of those. Um, but yes, so call and speak and, and um, write to your legislators, let them know that this ban needs to be in place and so forth. Jose, is the name of the organization the Equality Center? Um, the name of the organization is Oklahomans for Equality, and it's housed at the Dennis R. Neal Equality Center. And the website is okeq.org. Oh, Erica asks, oh, no. yes. why do you personally stay in Oklahoma? And could you put that website in the comments, please? There we go, yes. Um, <sighs> I was born and raised here in Tulsa. And this is the first time I'm saying it publicly and my executive director knows, people that love me know, I am looking to leave. Um, I might come back, um, but, I, but I do want to um, move. Um, just because I don't want to live in constant fear of my life anymore. If when you work at the Equality Center, you get calls all the time. Hi, I'm trans. I just came out and I just got fired. What can I do? Nothing. Hi, I was walking through the park with my partner holding hands and we just got beat up. What can I do? Hi. Me and my partner went to a restaurant and they just told us, we don't serve your kind here. What can I do? And then I have calls. My landlord is kicking me out because I'm, because I just, I just moved in with my husband, my partner. What can I do? And it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's heart, heartbreaking. I was beat up in Walgreens on a, on a, on a, on a 9, 9 a.m. morning when I had the flu, just because I had a rainbow shirt. I was sick like a dog and I was just there to get some medication and go back to my car. I was harassed and as LGBTQ individuals who are harassed, we just know to block him. You know what? Look the other way. I'm done. Not right now. And he, he wouldn't leave me alone. I went to my car shut the door, pull it out. He broke my, my, my mirror, opened the door and start beating me inside, start spitting at me and start calling me homophobic slurs and racial slurs. And when the officer came and took the report, he said, 
the only reason I can consider this a hate crime is because he used racial slurs. And right then and there, I'm only half of who I am is protected. So for individuals to live in constant fear, that's why, that is why individuals leave, they move, they go to New York, they go to L California, they go to other places more progressive because they want to have what hetero relationships have, a family, a safe place, a neighborhood, the white picket fence, safety for their kids to run around and, have, and be safe. So why have I stayed here and I'm still advocating? I am, I am because I'll, I understand that when you move and leave, nobody stays here, nobody's here to help. But I, 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 I've been doing it for six years and I know there's other people who've done it for way longer. And you know what? I bow to you. Wow, you are amazing, strong individual. But do I really, I, I've questioned myself, do I really, I'm 27 and I've done this for six years. Do I really want my whole youth, my whole young 20s, to just be focused on a fight on a, at a system that is not built for me. And, and I, I wanna live life. I, I, want, I want to be happy. I deserve to be happy. And so what I want is inspire others. That's all I, that's is the reason why I, I, I started and I continue to advocate. I want to inspire. I want to help others and say, you know what, even if it's for one year, even if it's for five years, if it's for 20 years, if it's for your entire life, you do what you can do. I've done, I'm doing what I can do. But that, that's the reason why. That's the reason why I'm still here. That's the reason why I'm fighting. I hope to inspire another gay Latino boy born and raised in North Tulsa where, where we, where the odds are always against, stacked against them. But then no, you, you, there's a world out there for you. There's others like there for you. These rural areas also highlight, find safe places and let people know that you are here. You're queer and you're not going anywhere. It is time. And when, the, when this administration has been reversing so many things that the previous administration, Trump, uh, the Obama administration, oh, please, Trump. Please, please, don't, please, has done reversing all of those. It's throwing us way back again. And just got to continue fighting. It's fighting and fighting. And the question is, when is fighting done? When, are, when is fighting over? When is, when, is, when, is, when is enjoy life, be happy, and live your best life time? When, it, when is that? When is that going to be? And so I can only, I only want to inspire people to continue working. Um, and I do, I do, I do plan to move. Um, and I might come back, I might not, whatever the world and destiny has where it placed me. But I know that anywhere I go, anywhere, anything I do, I will continue advocating for intersectionality. Any board, any committee they ask me to be joined, I will continue opening eyes and telling them, where are these voices being represented? We need to make space for them. So I, only, I, can, I can only wish everybody um, good health and good happiness because that's what I want. And inspire folks to register to vote. Yes, well said, yes. Also that, um, uh, that's something that I've also been working with the um, uh, Hispanic community, uh, Latinx, there's a lot of um, fear. So as the, I'm, I'm the chair of the Hispanic Affairs Commission, and so with this commission, it is um, to build a bridge within the Hispanic community to the city of Tulsa. And there's these, all, these, all, all of these uh, fears of, well, the senses are here. And I was, I was shocked. I was shocked of even finding out within my family. Uh, my family said, we are, we, 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 we've been here for years. We've never filled out these census. What is this? Just this year. And to help, I helped educate every, all of uh, what the census were and why it's important. Well, well are, are they gonna come find me? Because I do still have undocumented family members. And hearing how they fear for, the, for you know, their life is another thing why I fight for them. But also with registrating, reg, reg, registrating to vote. Oh, I just got my citizenship. I got my papers. Okay, now, now what, what's next? Now I can finally, their, their, thing, their thing is, now I can finally, finally go work 
and not have the fear of getting fired with no repercussions. Because they're working, but they're, but hey, if you don't do this, I'm gonna fire you. But no, you can't. I can't complain. I can't report. I can't report it to the uh, late to the to the labor department. How abusive and um, harassment you are, because I have to feed my family. But when they get their citizenship, the first thing is finally, finally, I can get a job where I'm protected. And other and uh, these other privileges that individuals who are citizens that we were born here, we take we don't we don't we take for granted. And to them, it's. It's, it's the most amazing thing in their life at that time. And so what I'm trying, helping do is like, okay, also part of this, also, also the amazing thing that you can do with this is vote and educate how they vote. And, and with the media, they only have, they only see, well, I, it looks like I can only vote for Trump or Joe Biden, like, um, or, or these individuals that we constantly are thrown through media. But when to get to the ballot, oh, there's also these judge, there's also these uh, city county commissioners. There's also um, these counselors. What do I do now? And so now we also have to educate with the ballots. Like, okay, it, on this ballot, you're gonna see all of these names. These individuals are for LGBTQ rights. These individuals respect um, immigrants, you know, so forth. I'm not gonna tell you who, you know, who, who, um, who to vote for, but I'm gonna tell you this person right here supports your identity, your family, your rights, and also this person also, but if you wanna find out this, we find out yeah, what questions do you have and so forth and try to bring those voices to the table. So yes, register to vote is also a happy medium for them. Thank you I so much. Add, oh, I just wanna add before, um, on to registering to vote. If y'all are in Oklahoma and you're voting absentee because it's a little safer with COVID, I am a notary uh, you can reach out to me and I will notarize your ballot for you and Jose and uh, Toby if you'd like me to set something up to come down to the Equality Center I will be happy to if any of y'all are with organizations in Oklahoma that you would like to do that I'm happy to do that and I'm involved with a group of affirming and open notaries yeah the Equality Center also has established notary too we want to make sure highlight all of that so hey there's several good good Perfect. Thanks for sharing that, Erica. And thank you, Jose, for uh, being open and vulnerable with us and, um, you know, and for the audience, for your participation and currently uh, and um, encouraging him to share his story. That's what we're here for, to honor your many, honor all of our experiences and addressing the traumas that we've dealt with um, as a collective and individually. So, Jose, I'm sorry for everything that you've endured. Um, you are a strong, strong individual. And we appreciate everything that you do for the community. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sharing your Saturday with us. Yeah, thank you everyone for your time. And if there's anything we can do, please, the website's there. I'm going to go ahead and put my email address as well. And Perfect. the Equality Center is here for everyone. Thank you, Jose.